All right, welcome back to the Hunt the Front podcast. We got another uh, interview episode, if you will, with a, a special guest on the on the show today. We're bringing in uh, Chris Ferguson. Fergie time is on the show. Chris, how uh, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. Just got back from the race car shop. Was doing a little pressure washing, but uh, you guys got me out of it a little early. <laughs> well, glad. I, I hope we didn't put you behind and maybe got you out of the work uh, and let let the crew handle it or something. But we're getting, this is the Wednesday night before All Tech, the Hunt the Front Super Dirt Series heads to All Tech. Obviously, practice got rained out for tomorrow, but getting ready for a Friday Saturday doubleheader there. Um, you, you know, one of the reasons we brought you on the show, which we've been talking about interviewing you anyway, but one of the reasons is you just uh, came you announced yesterday that uh, last night that you're following, planning on following the Hunt the Front Series, uh, going for the championship. Obviously, that starts started at Talladega, but we're going into to the rounds two and three at Alltech. So, how you feeling going into it? What's the thoughts? Uh, you know, with the as you're looking ahead to the the season, and obviously with the kind of kicking it off, uh, at least the chase for the championship, if you will. Uh, now that you've committed at uh, at Alltech, well, I would feel good if it was after Talladega, but I barely, well, I didn't really make the show at uh, at Bulls Gap last week on Sunday. I actually, had a provisional because I finished fourth on. The first night we made our way past a few cars but we didn't we didn't have the performance that we expected so you know definitely a little hesitant going into all tech but regardless i've learned a lot about the sport over the years and one thing that you you got to do you got to have the mentality that you can bounce back the next night and um just like before uh, you know i've missed the show or something and come back and continue for a win the next week so feel like we can do that at all tech and i've been very mediocre at all tech but it's been against a lot of really good cars so i feel like if we do dial it in we have a shot of winning yeah. what i was that's what i was going to ask you is what uh, i don't think have you ran much at all tech like what's kind of your your history there uh when and, and i think you were there last year with us whenever we ran started the season there but kind of what's your uh your past uh experiences with all tech i've been there twice i've, I've went there in the bloomquist car I believe with maybe the XR series. And then um, I think I went there with you guys in the Longhorn. So I've been there in both cars. Um, Both times I've been there, I've been a six through a 10th place car. And it's kind of funny because both fields were really diverse. Um, You know, it's really similar fields because that weekend we had with the Hunt the Front series, Ricky Thornton, Clanton, a lot of big names showed up. And, of course, at the XR race, um, you know, you had J.D., uh, Kyle Larson was there, all the really all the he- he- really heavy hitters. So um, I felt like both times I was there, my car was a lot better than the driver. So I've, I feel like I'm a sixth to tenth place driver there both times I've been there, and the car's maybe been a little better. How how tricky is all tech at for a driver uh, that that place? I, I think it's it's a significant place because it is to me it's it's extremely hard. But I'm a rookie, so in your opinion, how hard is all tech to navigate as a driver? It's probably the toughest track in the country, in my opinion. Um, it's like every time I go there, the last five laps, I really figure it out, and I'm like. Shh. I'm like, damn, if I could just restart, if I could restart the whole night, I would be a lot better. And uh, I don't know. It's like it goes from being real tacky. You know, you got to move around to where you can't be in one part of the track the entire time you're on the racetrack. And then about halfway through the race, all of a sudden that line comes in and you're like, holy, this is crazy. Like you just wasn't, you couldn't even touch it 10 laps ago. So it probably changes faster than anywhere. I, in my opinion, I haven't been to East Bay, but once in my opinion, it probably changes faster than East Bay and also any other track that I've been to. So it's very technical, but at the same time, it's a lot of fun and you can, I look back at my lap times a lot and I see how very, how inconsistent I am there, which is why I don't think I'm, I've never been great there yet. I, you can vary. You can be literally six tenths slower the next lap and four tenths quicker and then a second slower or a second faster. So it's just, it's just a crazy track. Yeah. That's one thing I've always found all tech interesting just because it's, it's like someone comes from out of nowhere uh, because they found a line that no one else was, was running. Right. Uh, or someone who's running well. Uh, and you can ask, you can ask Joseph about this, like seems untouchable. And all of a sudden they 
you know, drop backwards because everything changes. So it's, uh, it's definitely a unique place. And, you know, I'm excited. That's one thing when we started the series, I, I knew I wanted all tech to be a part of it. Um, you know, and they have been, that was where we had our opener, our, our launch the series last year and had our season opener and we're headed this year for a, a double header early in the year. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time talking, you know, talking just about that. Obviously if, for those you know listening, uh, you can, obviously if you're in the area, come on out. It's going to be a big show. Um, 5,000 to win uh, Friday, 15,000 to win Saturday, the Southbound Throwdown. That's one of the hardest names in, that we have of, of an event <laughs> name to get right. I call it Southern Throwdown, uh, Southbound, all kinds of other different stuff. But it is the Southbound Throwdown presented by Earth Tech. Uh, so come on out. If you can't make it to the track, tune in on Hunt the Front TV. Chris Ferguson will be there. Uh, we got a stout field. Brandon Overton, I haven't talked to him. He hadn't responded to my text, but um, he has it on his website. So I assume he's coming. Uh, we got Shane Clanton coming scott bloomquist should be there and then obviously all the uh, other hunt the front series regulars the ones that are, are still on board over 20 uh right now um still pursuing the the fifty thousand dollar championship uh including the the kid from milton that joiner kid he should be there too i think right right jesse i hope so i'm over here doing a podcast i don't know <laughs> jesse, i'm just kidding jesse nah. used to get out of the shop uh we're doing podcasts and streaming and, and all that stuff but one reason i wanted to have um uh, have you on the show, Chris? And uh, is I, I feel like, you know, you're an interest. You're an interesting uh, person in this sport to me because I've always followed you. Because I feel like uh, you were kind of coming onto the scene in the Carolinas and the Southeast whenever I really started. Um, I was actually starting as a journalist in the sport at, at Dirt on Dirt, and it's funny because I was doing some research for the show, and I looked back, and my first story I wrote for DirtOnDirt.com uh, when I was in 2009. And I actually got it pulled up here and I was going to, the headline, where'd it go? The headline is, as in September 7, 2009, uh, Madden denies Ferguson 10,000 at Cherokee. Do, do you remember that? I do. I remember it really well. Uh, my buddy, Scott Creel, cost me that race. So I was, um, I was leading. I led like 68 or 69 laps. 69 laps. laps so 75. <laughs> yep. Creel, Creel, we were lapping him and he decided he didn't know where he wanted to go. And, um, I, it, it doesn't really show it. I mean, you may have said it in the article, but I do remember because I ran in the back of them and I knocked the fenders down and the nose up with like six to go. We had a caution when that happened because I naturally I crashed them. And uh, <laughs> when I crashed them, I took off. And, dude, I had – I mean, naturally, the nose is up in the air a foot or two feet. The fenders are down on the tires. I think I maybe held on for fourth or something like that. But third, you were third. Third, yeah, behind him and Casey, and it's yeah. like I dominated that entire race, and and there's been so many times that that's happened, and and I hate to say it like this, is I don't want to take nothing away from Chris, but you know, me and Chris have had a lot of races at Gaffney, and I've always been on the losing end of it, whether it was my fault or not. It's like I've led races and he's won, and that one definitely sticks out because that was the first big one that got away from me. Actually, yeah. it was oh nine. It was actually a bigger one that got away from me in 08, but that was my first true year in supers. I was leading uh, the Clash Bash at Fayetteville by a straightaway, by half a track, pretty much. Broke rear in, and uh, which, you know, everything happens for a reason. And uh, Ed Gibbons ended up winning that race. So he passed away that next year. So right. I do remember those. They suck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to bring it up to, to make you remember, a, a, you know, a hard time there. I mean, it was me it was it was a good good showing for you as you were just getting going and uh you can't you've obviously come a long way since then i was i was looking and you've got uh a couple world outlaws wins to your credit i think three um lucas oil series wins the xr win at bristol i know was a big one for you um and a whole lot of other regional and, and other other wins uh, as well show me with the lucas oil series so you come a, come a long way since then but it's, it's always been cool to kind of follow along to your career because i feel like um, that was kind of when I started in working in the sport, right? Like, and you were just kind of, kind of coming on there. So it's been, uh, been, been interesting to follow along to your career, uh, with your career over the years. Um, and that's one thing I've always found interesting with you is, is you, you seem to have the the talent, right? And you've the resume to be a guy that runs nationally and, and you've gone and I mean, you ran nationally, but you've never really ran a national tour, right? Or gone out on a national schedule, um, you seem to kind of have your sweet spot of the amount of races you want to run and the type of races you want to run. You know, how, why, why is that that you choose to approach it that way? And, and is there a 
kind of a, a rhyme or reason yeah, yeah. yeah to how you take where it went and where you run um you know versus going head first into running you know a, a national tour and you know seeking the fame and glory of the lucas oil series of world of outlaws how, how do you choose kind of chris ferguson's approach to racing in this dirt late model uh sport well it's definitely changed over the last five to ten years for me um you know like five six years ago i really felt like i deserved a ride and i really felt like uh i was good enough to to go for you know clint boyer to call me or you know one of the national teams to give me a shout and uh especially like the the 2015 season like we we won i don't know 11 or 12 for i don't even know some some really good number of races and um i I always felt like you know i was good enough to do it but people really truly didn't understand how i was racing um you know that year alone we were kind of racing on what we were winning and we weren't winning uh, a bunch of big races but we won you know three or four ten thousands and a couple a bunch of fives and stuff like that and uh truthfully it was like i just never really got that call and it was it was a weird place with the sport because you had guys like lanigan and don o'neill and um you know that all the super heavy hitters too you know scott and and uh billy and and all them guys were still active in the sport you know they're still running crown jewels they're all still running tours steve francis was still racing there was just so many really talented drivers that um you know, I just never got the call to go drive for someone that was that was better than the ride I had. Um, that was the other thing too. I kind of had offers to to move laterally, uh, right? But for me, it just never really happened. So, um, you know, you do your best to gain sponsorship. You know, figure out where your place is in the sport. Um, you figure out what you want to accomplish, and then we we worked on that the next, you know, five years after that, the next from, from 15 all the way to now, you know, it's been 10, nine years now. And it's, you know, we got a hauler, we flipped it, got another hauler, flipped it. And then we started picking and choosing races we wanted to run. And we focused on being super prepared for the ones that really mattered. That was, that was the big step was when I felt like I could start contending in the dreams and the worlds and the north souths um and the show me's um even at fairbury when i started contending in those races and and being towards the front we would purposely take a weekend or weekend off beforehand um just to get ready go through the car really set everything have a plan for the weekend um freshen everything up because you don't want to go to these races and and break a transmission or a drive shaft or rear end uh, running in a transfer spot because it's so hard to get in position to win those races in the first place that you got to take advantage of it. So, you know, we just over a year, over the years, we just figured out, you know, how we needed to race to contend in the big ones, but also still run the races I want to. And it, it didn't, it wasn't no rhyme or reason. It was just, over time, we kind of figured it out, and you don't see me race a lot of times the week before the dream, a lot of times the week before the world. Um, these are the probably the two most important races to me, and you know, a lot of times that's why I think I've, I've ran good in those races from 2018 on. Um, you know, that's, that's one really thing I was going to bring up is. I feel like besides you win a lot of races, obviously, and, and have, you know, we, we said, you know, World Outlaws races and the show me and all, but, but I feel like one reason like Chris Ferguson, well, there's two, two real reasons outside of just winning races. You, you, you do really well and you've always done really good on social media, which I want to talk about later. But the other thing is you always seem, you've always seemed to run well at Eldora, right? Like, you know, we, we were talking about it before you called in Jesse and I about how, that that has been you can tell that you and your your team put a emphasis on running well there and do you feel like that's important to you your career you know obviously we every driver wants to run well at outdoor that's the the dream is to win the the dream in the world right those those races but you know for you and your career is that something that you you know you felt was really important it has been important to 
perform well on that stage, you know, to grow your fan base, grow the, you know, your following, bring all sponsors, all that stuff. Is that, that kind of been a, played a big part of your career? Yeah, I, th- I think it does. I think a lot of times when you do have the good runs in the big races um, and I, I don't really know the exact numbers, but I know like, I know Flo did a little stat one time where I'd, I'd had like 20 something top fives at Eldora since, since, um, since 2019, it was like, or maybe 29 top tens and 14 top fives or something. And it's like, for me, you know, everybody compares, uh, you know, when you watch football, you're looking at a Super Bowl, you know, you're looking for the NBA finals. For me, the, the world 100 and the dream will always be the measuring stick of, of success in the dirt late model world. Like I can't really name who all want, who's won Lucas Oil and world of outlaw championships. And I'm not knocking championships by no means, but I can remember guys like Steve case bolt won the dream 100. Yeah. I can mm-hmm. remember when Bart Hartman won the World 100. I can remember John Blakenship won the World 100. Yeah. And it's like, like his career making wins. It's, uh, Matt is. Miller is, I think, another Matt one. Matt Miller he, won the yeah. dream. Yeah. And it's like, to me, um, you know, the, um, you know, I, I do love championships, but I think that uh, Eldor is the, the way that you really measure someone. Like, listen, there's 30 guys, 40 guys, 50 guys that could probably run a national tour with the right team and be, I'm going to say semi successful, you know, they can go out there, contend every week and uh, run good, have good runs. And, and there's a lot of guys that's done that for a long time. Um, But to me, those guys um, don't stick out like the guys that's won the crown jewels. And that's just, that's just the, my feeling and that's the reason why i've always wanted to run good there and it kills me that i haven't won i've felt like i've i've had a couple good opportunities and just barely missed out but i'm hoping i'm still in that window to win them <laughs> according to del mcdowell and scott and billy and everybody else i still got a little bit of time i was gonna say you're still young compared to some of the guys that you know uh like you said dale mcdowell obviously went in well into his uh, older year you know late in his career we'll say that um you know and then scott you know not isn't too far removed from running well there so yeah i, th- I think you still got some time i, w- I would say <laughs> I hope um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> another thing we we kind of hit on uh with, with you that to me has always made you stand out is uh you know social media right like obviously everybody just about everybody now has a facebook page and um you know post uh photos and some do videos and everything and, and all, but you, you've kind of were one of the first I felt like to kind of gravitate toward that. Um, do you feel like that's, you know, when did you decide, yeah, Hey, I need that, to, I, you know, Jesse was saying, I think Jesse, did you have was, something? You well, to yeah. Like at what point, you know, you're talking about, I guess you said 2015, you're waiting for your big break. I, I'm not exactly sure, but w- at what point did you decide, Hey, I'm, I, I need to use social media and use a platform to, to do this on my own or, you know, like try to get my own sponsors and try to make something of all I can using social media. Like at what point did you decide that you were going to be able to, to do that or at least put forth the effort to try to what, at what point in your career did you decide that? There's, there's a really a couple big moments in 2012. Um, it's kind of going back before that, uh, I was racing ultimate series and, I had a little bit of success. I won the first year they had it actually outrun Casey Robertson, some really heavy hitters to win it the first year, but 2012, 2013 rolls around and like 2013, I didn't have a ton of success. I had a, a, I wouldn't say a bad year, just a down year. And that year was really, really tough because we, we just, I had the funding of Sturet Trucking during 2010 and 2011, and Jack passed away. So then 2012 and 13, we're kind of back on our own altogether. Like, you know, we were paying the tire bill, the fuel bill, the motor, everything. And we had kind of gotten help before then. And I didn't have no major sponsors. A major sponsor running a super late model for me at that time was like $5,000. That was, that was it. And so then, 2012, 2013, um, I'm racing at Dublin, North Carolina. And I've, it's like early in the year, right around May, 
uh, set on the pole of the race, but I choose the outside like an idiot and I drive into one and I spin out in front of the field, not even kidding. And when I spun out, I spun down the track, I killed Zach Mitchell. He was on the inside pole and, uh, and completely wiped out the race car. And me and my dad got super heated. Uh, he was like, post everything for sale on Facebook. And it's, I was like, all right. I'm, and I was like, I'm getting in my truck. I'm driving to the beach. We're selling all of it. And that was kind of the moment where I went to the beach. I posted it and I was like, I'm turning my phone off. I'm, you know, when I turned my phone back on like two days later, um, my uncle Keith called me. He said, Hey, I'm going to pay for your racing for a little bit and I'm going to help your dad get the car back. He's like, But you need to, you know, you, you guys need to sit down and figure this out. I talked to my dad. And I was like, listen, I got so much strain on me financially. I, I don't know if we can do this much longer. If you really want to do this, you, you need to either go find a ride or you need to get sponsors or do something. So that was that was the real first moment when he he literally told me to post it on for sale on Facebook. And this is like when Facebook started getting really popular too. So it was like, you know, people and then when I tore my car up, I, I got a little bit of help. And, um, that was the moment where I realized I needed, I needed help to really race supers even locally and regionally. Um, cause when we wiped out the car, um, when you don't, you know, you can t- fix spindles and control arms and stuff like that. But when you wipe out a race car, it's like, you gotta, you gotta start all over. And we didn't have the money to do that. So, but then I started learning, you know, I was like, you know, what, what do these people want to see? You know, what do the fans want to see? What do sponsors want to see? And the first thing first is the fans don't like you. Then sponsors definitely aren't going to like you. That's the reality of it. Like, right. And then they don't got to like you. They just got to be talking about you. You know, you got to be, they might, they might really hate you, but you know, exactly. (laughs) That's, that's kind of where I, I noticed, like I started, we, we started, you know, focusing on building a fan base. And I had a lot of help at the time, you know, it wasn't just me. It's always been, it's always been a team of people. Like I've been very fortunate um, to really have a lot of people. And truthfully, I, I'll just be honest with you guys. I didn't grow up in a super, I didn't grow up in a wealthy family, you know, and we didn't really have the money to go racing supers. So I wanted it a little bit different than everybody else you know there's a lot of people in this sport that kind of come into it and just go run a national tour and i'm like how you know that doesn't make sense to me but they do it you know and i'm not knocking them but um that just wasn't the case for me so starting to get sponsors and getting people to like you was the first step and and then over the years as people you know i like i feel people catch up with you and everyone else starts you have to really get creative and think of ways outside the box to do stuff for sponsors. Like, I mean, these cups I've had, I've had this cup since like 20, this is like a 2017 cup. And, um, it's got every one of my sponsors from that, from that year on the, on the cup. And dude, I sold probably a hundred of these. So, you know, a lot of these sponsors, one thing I'm very proud of is a lot of my sponsors have been with me for six, seven, 10, 10 years. And, um, you know, if you don't do nothing stupid, you keep them happy and, you take the time to talk about their business and appreciate them and appreciate them. A text, you know, I do a group text with my sponsors. I, I don't typically tell people that because I don't want people to always, I don't want people to, to, I don't want to lose my advantages I have, but I have a, a group <laughs> message with my sponsors that I text them and say, Hey, we're racing here this week. Here's where you can watch it. It takes two seconds. Um, right. And you don't have to, text all of them individually when you have a group text so <laughs> some you know. tricks of the trade there <laughs> everybody's, gonna be, everybody's gonna be catching up with fergie on the the sponsorship exactly. uh, so, acquisition and, and, well, and retention <laughs> well it's you know and you guys know this you, you you were the first to do uh the youtube and really in my opinion more creative content creation than anybody else so um for me you know we had to do this. I think you guys had to do this to get to the point where you're at, and I had to do it to get to the point where I'm at. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's, we wouldn't be here without it. That's for that's what. Sure. It's 100. And that's um. I, I feel like again, one reason, like when I was up there, those early, you know, 2009 to 2014 time period, 
or 2013, I guess, whenever it was, I don't know, but they got in the Carolinas, like I kind of gravitate, gravitated toward, toward you and like felt like, you know, I, was, I don't say I was a fan. I was, a, I'm, I was a journalist, so I was, I gotta be impartial or whatever, but you know, I liked the way you could tell you had that, you know, I gotta, I gotta make my own way here and do it right. Like no one's stepping in and really footing the entire bill to, to, for you to be able to go do it. And that's kind of our, our family and, and Jesse too, uh, came, you know, the hunt the front deal all came along because this is what we had to do to, to, you know, to be able to, I mean, we didn't know it at the time, but to be able to fund our racing was, you know, the YouTube and the grow the fan base, get sponsors, get fans and sell merchandise and, and all that stuff. So yeah, definitely can, can relate to that. One other thing you do that is interesting or is different. Um, and Jesse, and you know, can kind of can relate to this, and this might be a conversation between y'all, but is the the iRacing stuff. Yeah, what's that uh, giant wheel in front of you? Yeah, I guess yeah. I that what's going on there? <laughs> so, so those are R9 from my friends at WR1 Sims. You, you, your friends, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Chad Wheeler, you know, this yeah. is WR1 Sim Rig, and uh, yeah, just, um, you know. It's a long story. <laughs> so, I, you know, you are, I would say, one of the most active uh, active in the sim racing sport. And uh, you got your hands in, involved and, and do a lot of good things for the, the iRacing community. Like, what what made you kind of dive into that? Because you're pretty deep into the sim sports and the sim sim racing at this point. What, what drove you the direction to do that? You know, the Ferguson's diversified, dude. He's, you know, social media now. He's sim racing, super late model driver. Like, golly. Well, honestly, it kind of started with my love for sim racing started when I, before I was racing go-karts. I would actually go over to my uncle's house and I would race NASCAR 2003. Um, I race online. My username was fireball ferguson <laughs> my L lpi which that was the most important back then laps per incident you remember that jesse and lpi I, I didn't get into the uh, last car but yeah. yeah so so i had lpi of like 245 and and uh you know just i enjoyed doing it because like during the summer i'd go over there and stay and he would race um like league nights until like 10, 11 o'clock. And I'd get on at 1130 and stay on till five in the morning. I would race Daytona, Talladega, Dover. And, um, I always enjoyed that. And then I, I got into the world of outlaws 2002 and actually got into, you know, online multiplayer. I had the, the plugin that went on the back of the PS2 to have online and then real racing started and I got away from all of it. So that all, you know, went away for a long time until 2020, you know, during COVID and, and I should have never bought a SIM rig or should have never should have built one, but, uh, it kind of reignited the fire to be involved with it. And the one thing that really stands out to me that really hits home with me compared to everybody else is. I understand what it's like to not have the money to race. Mm -hmm. And I know so many really good drivers and kids that can probably never afford to race in real life that are on the sim because they truly love driving and they enjoy racing. And I can relate to that in a way, you know, Me too. that's kind of where it all started. Their way of being, uh, getting able to be, you know, to do it basically is, yeah. is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is I racing. So yeah. And, and it, and it's not just being able to afford. It's just when you, you know, if you're born into a family that's never raced, maybe they just don't know how. So, yeah, exactly. you know, it's just that's, you know, the passion's there. And, and for a fraction of the cost of a real race car, you can go drive at home every night. Yep. Yeah. I, I, that hits home for me, man. That hits <laughs> home. That's me. I, that you're literally like, that's why yeah. I am so invested. Like, that's why I love I racing. Like, that is literally me. Like, my family. We didn't race that we didn't, you know, it just wasn't really what we did. But then, you know, me and Joseph being friends, it got me involved in it. Uh, but still, like, w without where we all this that we've done, I wouldn't be driving a real race car. And th sim racing was it, like, that was all I had, you know. And uh, it's the most competitive and, and fun thing you can do. It's it's more competitive than probably real racing because sometimes it's, it's it's super competitive it's you know no no room for errors <laughs> yeah it's not hey but you know if you wanted to be competitive in i racing where's the best place to get an i racing setup 
at Majulacy uh, Speed Shop. Use code JE1. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, it's it's so funny how all this happens. Like you know, when I got into all this, um, I never knew. I mean. I'll be honest with you. I, I clearly knew what I was doing whenever I reached out to, to Blake Majulis and Evan C. Like there's, yeah. that's like reaching out to Scott Bloomquist and Billy Moyer saying, Hey, let's, let's, let's draw up a business plan. And, um, I actually found the paperwork from our original contract. It wasn't a contract, but it was a, a piece of paper that I actually wrote with a pen that had like, you guys own 33% of CFM esports. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we absorbed 127 industries, and I'm not going to say we absorbed VLR, but we definitely absorbed Evan C building setups for VLR. Yeah, and uh, and it's just kind of amazing how it all happened because really Blake and Evan are very similar to us. You know, Blake doesn't have a family that races, um, you know, and and he become a world champion, and he got to drive a real late model at the dirt track at Charlotte, and. Same thing can be said about Evan. You know, he races go karts in real life, but um, you know, Evan, both of them have a legitimate shot at probably racing in real life now, just from their career and opportunities yeah. opportunities they got from our racing. Yeah, and uh, there's even NASCAR guys nowadays that I'm pretty sure have made it all the way to NASCAR that literally. They, I think they came from my racing. I can't think of their names to be exact, but the, the guy couple. that won the Daytona 500 didn't yeah, I know. his right, start. Like, that guy. Yeah. Like, they so, came from my racing. It shows you how much I know about uh, I'm following yeah. NASCAR these days. But, and uh, I remember they, they talked about that, right? Yeah. And here's another thing a lot of people always ask me, and I'm sure you get asked all the time, uh, uh, is how realistic is I racing compared to, to the real deal? You know, like how close is it? How close is it? I mean, in my opinion, it's the closest out of everything I've ever raced to real dirt racing. I yeah. mean, it's the only thing you don't feel is, you know, you don't feel the the movement in your seat, you yep. know. But the closing great, uh, your track awareness, your the way you set the car up, where you're going to run the cushion, and um, the way you're going to run the bottom, the way you have to drive straight in the slick, I mean, it's really damn close it's, it is it i my my response my response to everyone is it's the closest you're gonna get without actually doing it and that's the guy i think that's the guy that's, that's true that's the, just the truth it, so, it it really is so so one thing i did want just because i'm sure there's some people watching this who are listening that really don't know what you know what we're talking i mean they know what i racing is but i wanted to kind of go back to your your um seat is it the, the speed it's shop cfmesports.com right? Yep. Okay. Slash so, HTF. <laughs> slash, okay. So, so what it is is in iRacing, you, you know, you you have some races that are fixed setup where everyone you kind of just run like what the computer gives you, right? Like everyone's yeah. on the same setup. But then you have uh, where you can you can change, like just like a real car, you can change, you can make adjustments, right? And there's all kinds of different adjustments you can make, and um, you know, and and for different tracks and, and all that. So your your the business you guys have is kind of like you you provide setups those those uh different setups um for the different tracks it kind of does that explain it to some degree <laughs> yeah i mean it does for sure we have i think we counted the other day i didn't realize this we have six builders that are building for us nowadays that we um we basically pay them to keep everything updated and uh what we do is we build for everything short track where we're not in nascar yet but we build everything short track, whether it's dirt or asphalt. Um, we update this stuff daily. I mean, Blake and Evan are actually, they're doing this full time now. So their job is to wake up, uh, go to work, go test. And if they could do this in real life and I could afford it, it would, it would have sped my racing career up a lot. <laughs> um, but you know, like the reality of it is too, it's, it's, they're doing the hard work on that side of it, but then they also, what we've offered is a com community for people to learn how to drive also. Like that's a the part of that. It's, it's a consulting kind it's of deal. Basically, it's a consulting deal. And, and everyone knows this, this is, this is uh, just like real life. You're only as good as who you're racing with. So, um, you know, when you're going out there and you're learning bad habits from bad drivers or people that, 
per se aren't up to par, you're going to run at their level. But, you know, when you get in there and you're racing officials with the fastest guys in the country and you're seeing the lines they run, you're talking to them, you're, you're building a relationship because, I mean, that's just like real life. I built a relationship with Scott Bloomquist and my racing career took off. And, you know, I learned from him. You know, a lot of people have learned from somebody. So um, I got tired of sucking at iRacing, and that's why I even done this whole deal. And, you know, and then it just blossomed into more. And I'm not saying I'm great, but I've won top split races numerous times. And and that's when I get on and grind. It's just like real life. If you sit at home too much, you're going to suck. So yep. <laughs> uh, you got you to be at the track. But it is, man. It's, it's a lot. And it's a community of, of drivers and fans of racing and also people that just love sim racing. And it's, it's its own world that um, a lot of people don't understand, but they're definitely missing out on. Yep. I agree. And it's, you said community is a word you used. And, and that's one thing I found. I, yeah. I enjoy, I'm not good at it at all. And I don't have, He's I terrible. wish I had more time, He's terrible. Terrible. <laughs> but the one thing I enjoy is just getting on there, you know, and racing and, you know, obviously when I race with Jesse and jo Jonathan and Joseph, it was fun, but just the, the other people I know that are on there racing and you, you know, you, you kind of, it's enjoyable, right? Like, and you get to know them and it's a, like you said, kind of a community thing. Uh, obviously I was a lot more into it back during the COVID time period yeah. and, and all, but, but, um, but I still try to do it whenever, whenever I can. You mentioned one thing, um, that I wanted to wanted to talk about. And Jesse, Jesse did you have anything else you want to ask him on the, the no, iRacing stuff? I feel, like, I feel like we need to wrap it up because we could just probably keep on going and going and going <laughs> yeah, and going. You don't, you don't uh, Springs Flings at, the, at Eldora this year. Shut up! <laughs> Is that a new, Is this new news? Is this breaking news? <laughs> Is this new news? Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> hey, this that would be too. Joshua, the Spring fl Oh, we lost him. Oh, no. Dude, the Spring Fling... How much did it pay to win last year? Six thousand, dude. Holy 6, crap, Josh! I mean, yeah. yeah, you're kind of stuttering, but listen, he just mentioned the spring fling right before you left. Do you know what the spring fling is? Before yeah, we yeah, wrap up, race every year that you try to make and hey, don't make, it, and guess what? It pays, <laughs> guess what? It pays to win. Isn't it like four grand or something? Last year it paid six thousand to win. Jeez. Yeah. Eighteen thousand dollars per. Now somebody come, in, somebody come into the comments. Tell me it's just a game, fool. Come on, six thousand dollars. <laughs> come on, yeah, that's a big deal. Right there, you can sit, sit in your living room and do it, or your right. office, wherever you your rig, whatever. All <laughs> so, right, what you, where are we going next? Okay, I'm gonna cut y'all off on the yeah, sim we'll race. Keep going. Here we go. <laughs> you mentioned one thing, you know that you you know you were you struggle or, or Scott Blumquist connecting with him made you a lot better, right? And and you, kind of your career took off. Um, it's you, you are still in a Blinkwist car, correct? Or like, yeah, I know you have a Longhorn, but you, I mean, kind of like, I know McDowell still has one. Obviously, Scott's running, uh, his own stuff, but like the talk a little bit about that relationship with Scott, you know, and, and kind of even though he's kind of gotten out of the driver's seat a little bit, but he has signed on to run the, the, front, the front series this year, but kind of talk about that relate your relationship with Scott and kind of where you are now, um, you know, with, with those cars. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long, it's been, you know, now it's been a long relationship. It was fresh for a long time, but it's been a two way street. And um, Scott worked with us a lot from day one. So that was, that was a massive thing. It was uh, not only getting in his cars, but then being able to call on them and, and, uh, you know, have help and, and learn about certain scenarios and, track conditions and how you want to set your car up for a hundred lap. All that really was the, was the really the, the kind of the, the holes in my racing career that I had, he kind of filled in. So I felt like I could get it done in the short races and the really fast and tacky tracks. There for a while I was known for qualifying on the pole everywhere I went. So um, when I got his cars, I got better in long races and it wasn't just one thing. It was, it was him teaching me, you know, how to groove and sipe your tires, how to, uh, where to put your, put your lead in these situations, where to set your fuel, um, you know, also how to take care of your edges. Um, just so much stuff I learned and, and, and also working with Shane and Dale too definitely helps. I mean, there's three hall of famers that, you know, they've forgotten more than what most people know. So, um, 
you know, I got a Longhorn because, you know, Scott's really not in a position to build cars right this second. And, um, which he's, you know, I think he's still talking about doing it. I think he's still going to. So, but I took my car up there this past winter and we put it up on the, on the jig and got everything straightened out. And clearly there's been times where I've shown a lot of speed and there's been times where I've been off, but, um, I don't really know how long I was racing the car last year with the front clip twisted. So I think a lot of my notes was they're a little bit off from where I probably um, should have been, but um, you know, working with him and then I'm not knocking the Longhorn because I want a 20,000 wind show with it. I think they're both great cars, but when I go to Eldora, when I go to the show me the North South to all these races where I've had great runs in Bloomquist, I, I know what, I know what I need for the most part. You got good notes there. You know? It is. So, so you mentioned, you know, Scott's not in position to, to build cars right now. Or, so and it, feel free to say you don't want to talk about it or, you know, that's, you know, that's proprietary information. Or whatever, but w- so when did, when's the, like, how old is your car? Right. When, like, when did he stop building cars? Like, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to remember, like, you know, there for a while, obviously his cars were, you know, he was winning everything. You, McDowell, other people in his cars that were, but like, it's kind of like, I, like when it, when I remember that you and Dale are still in Bloomquist cars, it's like I for you know they can't be, you know, recent or kind of what's the yeah. situation there? That, as much as you want to talk about. <laughs> well, so I had two of them, and I did sell one to Brian Shirley, and he won an Eldor Prelim last year with that car. So, and he was ran great with that car a lot, and um, that car has been front clip twice. Uh, it's had a rear clip put on it, and um, it's probably got two hundred something races on it. And it's still a, I mean, in my opinion, it's still a fast car. I mean, every time he's unloaded, he's been really good. My car that I have is a car that I primarily ran at Eldora for four years. Um, I only would unload it at the dream in the world. And then up until 2023 last year was the first year that I really raced it the whole year. So it's a 2018 car. I didn't race it until the dream in 2019. I ran fourth with it. And this is the car that I've raced at the dream or the world every year or the, and also I rented the, I rented at the North South and set on the pole and ran fourth with it in 2020. And, um, it's been, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have a ton of races on it. I'd probably say it's up upward, maybe 70 races on it or 80. Um, but it has had a, the front clip has been a worked on and then it, it's been the fuel cells been replaced because I crashed it at the world or maybe at the dream makeup last year or 2022, one of the two. And, uh, but it's, um, it's a really good car and, and my, uh, my cars are old, but you know, they weren't raced a lot. This car wasn't. And people don't realize this, but when Scott was winning the show me's and the dreams and worlds and stuff, he was racing cars that were two or three years old and Dell McDowell's the same way. And, um, that's the one thing that I can say about his cars, uh, the material he uses and the way they're structurally built. They seem to last a lot longer than any other brand. Um, and I mean, I'm not taking nothing away from any other brands. I'm just saying the track record kind of speaks for that. And, uh, you know, my opinion, like, you know, I think Scott, people are also like people's memory in dirt late model racing is so bad. They forget how bad, or how good Chris Madden was in Scott's car in 20. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, and it was, you know, year, year and a half before that Scott won the world or the dream and the show me and, and Dell's won the dream in 19 and, and won that hundred thousand last year. And I just, I think when Randy sweet passed away and the jig was, you know, kind of moved around at first because Scott Bruce was going to build the cars and then, that kind of fell through and then Scott was going to build them. And then that kind of fell through. It's just in a weird place right this second. And I mean, Scott, we've talked about it this year. He'll build me another car and um, it just hasn't happened yet, but I mean, hopefully it does. And because even if he does, I'm not saying he's going to quit anytime soon, but even if he does, if he wants to um, Scott's got a place in this sport for a long time, as long as he wants. And it can be on a broadcast. It can be uh, consulting. It can be building race cars um, because his knowledge is, is so far beyond what people realize. And, you know, I don't want to see any of it go to waste. So I would love to see him 
you know, building race cars and being a personality. All right. I, so that's one reason I brought that up because I, I find that interesting because you hear the, and you hear things, but you hear like about guys that, you know, some of them go through five cars a year, right. To get the, the right car. Yeah. It's like I said, it's a testament to what Scott does and, and what they've done. And really like that people knew like McDowell's cars the same way. I mean, he's got a couple of new cars that were basically, I, th- I believe they were stored. They were in storage, but um, it's just, it's amazing to see how they run. And, and honestly, like I don't really have the money to build four or five cars. So, you know, I make it work regardless, but when we, when you know, during the winter, we take these things all the way down to bare chassis and redo them. So, I mean, when we start the year, it's basically like a brand new car. It's, it, I don't know. I just still blows my mind that, you know, that you, you, you guys, you and Dale, like, it's not just like, it's one guy, you and Dale both. And, and even Scott, you know, ran, ran well on those for so long shows, like you said, kind of a testament to what they are. But, um, uh, yeah, one thing. So another thing I want to talk about, you know, we kind of hit on it earlier, obviously you, you know, came out and said, you're going to run the, the front series or at least give it a shot at the championship. Um, going to all tech, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but, but where do you see, you know, as you look at the series and, you know, I know there's some, there's some really good talent on there and, you know, just like you jumped on this week, we could have another one or two that jump on before it's said and done. But, you know, where do you see yourself shaking out on the series and, and, you know, like, is it, is it championship or bust or kind of, how, how do you feel about it? Jesse, do you want to add uh, yeah, to that? Yeah, I want to add to it a little bit. Like, so the last, see, so you won a, a series in 2011. When's the last time you ran a full time series, or, or, or I guess you could say a full time series? Well, I was run. I ran second. I ran ultimate again in 2013 and ran second to Casey Roberts. Yeah. Um, I did run uh, NDRL until it shut down. Y'all remember that? I, I remember, remember that, that back, yeah. back in the. Did it not make it? Did it not make it through? It. Yeah, we got uh we got to uh Chillicothe and uh didn't get paid show up money and uh and it rained out and yeah, that was that was that. But uh yeah, that that was pretty much the last time I Oh, well, actually I I tried to, I started pursuing World of Outlaws in 2018 and I wasn't happy with, you know, I was like 8th or ninth in points, but I wasn't happy with what we were showing up at the racetrack and we were running, running for seventh through tenth. Yeah. It wasn't fun, and and that's when I actually made the change. The opportunity come about with Bloomquist, and um, it was like drop off tour, make a career decision right here. And it's it's so funny, it's so like cool to look back at because I actually talked to Steve Baker about this, um, and we, you know, Steve called us and said, "Hey, you know, I, I know you're frustrated with your car." And my dad was very transparent with Steve and he said, Steve, we got a Bloomquist car on order and Scott said he's willing to work with us. We went to a shop and Steve literally told us, Steve Baker, probably one of the most influential dirt late model Rocky guys in the chassis, world. For, for those um, who don't know. Told dad, he said, if Scott's willing to work with you and you can learn from Scott, you're stupid if you don't do this. So um that was the last time i technically just tried to run a tour yeah yeah all right so now you're you're uh you just committed you're running the hunt the front super dirt series what's uh what's your thoughts behind that like what what was the influence what did what made you decide to jump in head first we're doing it i mean truthfully i I do have a lot of sponsors that want to see me run they want to see me commit to something i haven't even put out a schedule for this year so as you can imagine they're all mad about that and uh it's not that i didn't want to put out a schedule i just wanted to see how i was lining up before i decided what races i was going to go to and um so after a couple good runs and bad runs um you know we feel like we wanted to still run the big races but we wanted to run there was probably 10 of y'all's races i was going to run regardless regardless of situation so if there's that many races that I was going to run and, um, you know, going to be a part of it, then why not just jump in and run the other, however many it is. And, and, and really with none of them falling on top of the dream, the world, the North South to show me, um, all the races that I kind of care about. I did have some of my fans from poor Royal said they were going to miss me. Um, but that's, you know, that's a whole, you know, 13 hours away or whatever. And, and, um, you know, there's some places I'm going to miss, but at the same time, I'm going to some tracks that I've always wanted to go to. So 
the schedule really looks good for being from North Carolina. Um, you know, I very, 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 very fortunate to have a little bit of help with um, travel expenses, but um, you know, you take in all the account of getting off on, you know, I can race on a Friday, Saturday. Um, I'm only missing a Friday off of yeah. work. And that's big for my team because I don't actually have no full-time employees. Everybody on my team is volunteer or family. And um, so for me, that's big. I don't have to, you know, leave on a Wednesday or, or a Tuesday per se. And, and really looking at Friday, Saturdays or Saturday, Sundays or whatever. And also the money, you know, the money you guys are paying to win. They're paying for the mid season points, the total points. And, and for me also, you guys do a great job with exposure for sponsors. And for me, it's like, that's the reason why I do what I do and I'm able to do what I do. So my sponsors were tickled to death. My, uh, my, I, I'm sponsored by Srixon, the golf company. And, um, my, uh, my, my golf rep texted me earlier and said, uh, he said, I just got my subscription for HTF. So oh, I'm like, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So, so I'm like, yeah. you know, it's, it's cool that they're following along. They know what HTF is and it just, it all makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm going to be realistic because, you know, the sport's very humbling. So, um, you know, I do want to contend for a championship. I, I definitely expect to. Uh, there's a lot of tracks on the schedule that I'm, I love going to that people don't even realize I love going to. Like, well, I, I've won at Magnolia before. I've ran really good at Magnolia. I've ran really good at Why Not, Lancaster. I've won big races at Gaffney. Um, and even some of the other places that you guys go to. And Friendship just, or uh, uh, Ultimate? Yeah. Hey, I won a outlaw race there, but I also yeah. got my ass kicked last week and <laughs> missed the show. So, you know, like, like, like you said, it's a humbling. It's humbling. It's very <laughs> humbling. So, but I, I know what I need when I go back. So, um, you know, I, I really feel like I can contend for a championship. You know, I, I want to win some big races. I want to win some of these 20s and 25s. Um, you know, there was a time like it at Talladega where I think I could have got around um, Brandon and lap traffic. I was kind of riding, but also just making sure I was there if he messed up and it didn't happen. So, you know, I want to contend for wins. If you contend for wins then the championship happens naturally. So, um, but I do realize there's a lot of good talent on tour and, and um, a lot of young guys that are, that used to be me, you know, and, and um, they're going to be tough along with, you know, if Brandon commits to it, I don't know if Brandon's going to or not, but, you know, Brandon would be fun to race with week in, week out. He's definitely got the edge. He's had the edge over myself for a long time now, but um, there's times where I feel like I can line up to him and I can outrun him too. So, um, you know, racing with Scott too. I mean, there's there's so many – I mean, so many good guys. I mean, there's people that are very underrated running all's tour too. Like I seen Zach Mitchell was on the regular deal yeah. and he, um, you know, Zach's very underrated in my opinion. He can go anywhere and, and just like you guys, I mean, just like Joseph and I mean, there's just so many people that are, I think it's going to be exciting to see. I think, um, my opinion, if, if I can run like I do when I go to big races and show up every week with that mentality, I'll be fine and, and contend. But if I get caught slipping, then I can be out of a show very easy. Yep. It, it's tough. I mean, it's uh, Joseph had to use a pr few provisionals last year. And it wasn't near the, the, the field as it is this year um, for sure. But uh, I think Jesse, um, you know, that's, that's, Good stuff. We've covered a lot, and I know we've gone longer yeah. than we told you we would, but I think Jesse has a couple questions for yeah, you and before I, we uh, wrap it up here. I also just want to point out to everybody we have terrible internet where we're at, and we had horrible storms, and if there's any kind of just, uh, audio discrepancies and stuff that 
it's because we, our internet's terrible and we had bad storms. All right, so, t- hey, man, well, we're glad to have you on tour. And, uh, yeah, we're excited for the season for the Hunt the Front Super Dirt Series. You can catch it all live at Hunt the Front uh, or HTF TV. Um, uh, so I had a few questions just kind of wrap this deal up that I've been asking everybody that we have pretty much have interviewed. And you've already covered one of them about your crew and, you know, they're all volunteers and all that that go with you. Uh, but but who exactly, like, who's your crew? Like, give them a little shout out, a little plug here. Like, who? what's it look like for Chris Ferguson Racing when you when you load up in the truck and you go to the racetrack? Um, my dad is my, my, you know, he owns a car. He is the, uh, the main guy. He crew chiefs. Um, his name is Brian Conard. He's, you know, he's one of the smartest guys in the pit area. People don't even know it because he's very humble and he keeps to himself, but, um, he helps out more people than you guys would ever realize. Um, Terry, AKA Cutlass, um, Terry's tire tips. He's uh he's pretty famous. He's he's a pimp. He's got like five girlfriends. And oh, he uh he's retired and he comes racing with us. Uh my brother Brandon, he's been with me since day one. You know, he doesn't get to come all the time because his job. Uh, but he when he comes naturally, it's like having another dad. The same thing with um Tadpole, which is a very weird dynamic, but my parents separated when I was like five years old, so it's been, you know forever yeah. my mom's husband tadpole he comes with us and uh he does all the body work on my race cars he also is the n- notorious guy that punched mark richards in the face oh my god um, and but he's but listen like he's got my back through thick and thin and um you know i bad mark richards if you're listening um <laughs> and you know uh kevin myrtle I always post them on my snap stories. He's young. He's single. He's ready to mingle. Um, He weighs like 110 pounds. Um, I also have truck driver Trey. And then like, this is like the guys that (laughs) fill in. This is the guys that fill in. Cause like out of the next probably six or five, you never know which one's going to be there at the track. So truck driver Trey, JB, um, uh, Zach, uh, David Chapman, Corey Tanner, Chris Gouin, um, uh, Mark, and Shannon and Fred. Yeah, there's like, okay, there's a so, lot. So, but, but they don't all go at the same time. It's kind of like a cycle. And at, Eldora, they, hey, at Eldora, they do. There's like 50 of them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a Gaffney. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So the next question is, what – like what did you start out racing what was the first race car you ever got into and drove go-kart. on go-karts All right, yeah what go-kart about race car? what about a race car though a dirt late model man a crate late model Great. so straight from go-kart to dirt late model or yeah late i model. thought i was i thought i was willing that thing i was like letting off in the corner and jeff smith jumped in my car and held it wide open for five laps and i was like yeah I'm, i got a lot to learn uh-huh uh-huh. Well, that was a, he was that was going from a rookie to a veteran in it like he, he should be a better better you know yeah. able to go a little quicker around there all right okay <laughs> final question um your biggest you know the, your most memor- mem- uh, memorable 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 win that you have recorded to date the sh- uh the show me i mean the show me so the show yeah. me did it pay less than the xr race it was fifty thousand they were both, they were both 50? fifty. All right, so yep. the show me that's a that's a big one. Yeah, so yeah, the uh, passing like anytime you pass J- Jonathan Davenport for a crown jewel win, I mean Jonathan Davenport, he texted me on the way home from um, uh, wherever we were last week, Bulls Gap. He was following me in the souvenir trailer, and uh, you know to have his respect means a lot. You know we may get into it on the racetrack, but JD is the Scott Bloomquist of my time. So that's. Um, that's, you know, but I, yeah. I took, you know, he, he, you know, he's got seven or whatever, seven globes or whatever. He's got six or I don't even know what he's got, but, uh, I got, I took one crown jewel from him out of the 50 he's got. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. To take that one. That's right. I, I do imagine that Bristol winning the XR race yeah. there was pretty big for you. I would imagine. Yeah. That, that entire two weeks, you know, we, we won, we ran second in the other from like eighth, and it was exciting when I ran second because I passed Shepard, uh, Devin Moran, all them guys on the outside, Ricky Weiss. And then the other race, I ran third from like uh, wherever I started, and then I blew a tire. Really, if I didn't blow the tire, I think I probably would have won the extra 50000 but I think I yeah. won twenty five for second. But yeah, right. yeah Bristol, well – 
Bristol was exciting that year. But the, in my opinion, the first year, 2021, whenever <laughs> Kyle Larson ran second, Davenport ran third, Scott Bloomquist ran fourth. When I won that first race back, that was pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, big. That was cool. Yeah. All right. Well, hey. Well, uh, I. Uh, I think it about covers it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have, is, that, is that your questions? <laughs> no, I, th- I think that covers it for my end. Uh, hey, uh, we, we are glad to have you on the show here, Ferguson. Uh, Fergie time. Hey, man, where can they get some merchandise from you? Uh, Shop Fergie 22. And for this week only, if you use uh, promo code HTF, it's free shipping. Oh, I go. like it. Yeah. I like it. All right. Just for our viewers. Hey, heck yeah. We appreciate you. Glad to have you here on the Hunt the Front podcast. And uh, hey, uh, looking forward to seeing you down at all. Oh, crap. What? I've messed up. What? Bro. Okay. I'm glad I just don't remember this. I named the entire crew. I did not name Jenna Gentry. Oh. <laughs> my fiance. <laughs> I mean, you guys know because you both deal with it. Uh, so I mean, my yeah. fiance is there every week. Ooh. She runs, she runs the merchandise trailer and Sweet Victory. So let's get that in. I done messed up at Talladega and I about did it again. So oh, we're good. Oh, okay. Hey, you, you clearly you saved yourself. You're still it's in trouble, catch. though. You're still going to be in trouble. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, well, we're looking forward to seeing you down at Alltech uh, for the Hunt the Front Super Dirt Series race number two. Uh, you know, like I said before, if you uh, ain't going to be able to make it down there, be sure to watch it all live on Hunt the Front TV. Um, you know, looking forward to having you on the series tour. I'm glad to have you on the podcast. It's been real. And uh, hey, we'll see you there. Hey, like, comment, subscribe, everybody. We'll see you all on the next one.